So we're here with former RAF pilot Phil Keeble to talk about something a little different from our normal episodes and this is on the duties outside the cockpit. So Keebs, can you talk us through about this and what was the official name for these roles? Oh, I don't think you want me to, Mike. I don't think <laughs> the pilots want me to. It's, it's, a, it's the RAF's dirty little secret. <laughs> Slave labour. In other words, they, they sucker you in with the, 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 the charming thought, the exciting thought of, of flying all day, and then you spend half your life on the ground doing what we call SLJs, which, do you know what that stands for? I don't know. Silly little jobs. <laughs> Some of them were actually very important and had to be done. I know that. But they were called, officially, it was called GD, General Duties Branch. We thought GD stood for General Dog's Body. But um, it amounts to the same thing. It, um, these were duties which uh, had to be done. And they had to be done either um, when you weren't doing your primary role. So officially, flying always took priority. But there were times when um, you might be taken off the flying program to do a secondary duty, um, a general duty. And it applied to air crew, pilots, navigators, not so much. So they didn't do a lot. Um, air traffickers, administrators. I'm not sure about engineers, air electronics officers, air warfare officers, WIZOs, whatever you want Whatever the name is for people that sit in cockpits and 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 uh, wear the uh, the uniform of an officer, um, generally everybody was involved, and they were supposedly shared out equally amongst everybody. But I've just read in a book this week, and I've just quoted it to somebody else. If you want a job done well, give it to someone who's busy. <laughs> now that was true. If you know. And that's always the way. There were little skivers that did Sweet Fanny Adams. And there were other guys like me who were very good and, and never had a moment's peace. And I'd have a stack of secondary duties and jobs to do. All sorts of things. So just to get on to them, there were different, different areas. Some were station duties. Uh, some were squadron duties. Um, and some were even command or RAF duties. So I've got a few notes here just to remind me because there were so many. Um, so station duties were things like station duty officer or if you're a bit junior, a junior um, a flying officer or pilot officer, or the officer. And basically you were sort of the, the go-to man on an RAF station when the rest of the station were either in the bar or at home in bed. And they used to come round, um, albeit on a regular basis, maybe once every couple of months, um, sometimes more, sometimes less. Um, basically, you were there to answer the phone, um, take in secret signals, um, sort out any problems that arose, like domestic problems, fights in the airman's mess. And I've done all those. And even, even I've been to um, some unpleasant things, like when I was in Malta, we had an aircraft crash. Uh, on its approach and in fact it was only myself and the dock that got there first so we were in the thick of it the fire engines were too big to get down the narrow lanes i hijacked a bicycle and off a bloke and he said yeah off you go and um the dock was in a mini so the dock got there about the same time as me and we had to deal with it and that was quite traumatic actually but there was there was no counseling in those days nobody said, you know, do, do come and talk to a psychiatrist or psychologist. Um, you just with it. <laughs> with it, washed your hands, and, and if the bar was still open, went out a few beers. And that was the psychology of the Air Force. Now, it's all changed now. So um, that was station duty officer. Could be a real pain at the weekend um, if you were in the mess on your own, everybody else was at home, um, and you've read all the papers twice. And... Two channels on the television back in the 60s and that was your lot and um, you just stared at the four walls until somebody phoned you up with a, an issue I've had fights in the airman's mess I remember one funny occasion when the, myself and the duty sergeant and the duty corporal haired off down there and there had been some fighting and I was going to go in and in fact it was the same advice as I got when I was in the police force 
the uh, the sergeant said to me, don't go in, sir, don't go in, and I'll go in. He said, if they hit me, they won't get up. If they hit you, there'll be a court-martial. So <laughs> you stay outside and sort out the paperwork, which I thought was a good thing to do, but I wanted to see what was going on. And same in the police force. We used to go to incidents, and we used to go with dogs. And if it was a, a, a big pub fight, um, the experienced coppers would say, no, we send the dogs in. When it goes quiet, we'll, we'll follow up. And it's true. <laughs> and it saves an awful lot of unpleasantness. Yeah. I don't know if you've read any of uh, Terry Pratchett's books, the um, uh, his, um, what do I call them? The Watch, the Watch series. There's nine in the series within his genre. And that's their attitude as well. He obviously knew what went on. So, yeah, that was um, station, um, the main station duty. There was a way to sort of sort it out. Um, if you volunteered for Christmas Day or Boxing Day or Christmas Eve or New Year's Eve, it counted as treble. So what I used to do, because I never went out on New Year's Eve, I'm not Scotch, and um, I used to volunteer for uh, New Year's Eve into New Year's Day, and that would count me as three times the normal number of so i only probably did one more in the year so as you get older you, you learn these tricks and certainly on qra i mean just getting out the subject which was a ground duty in a way you know until yeah. it, till it wasn't i mean you could spend 24 hours locked up with nothing to do and you'd have to watch television and read but again we were sought out with the the squadish members of the, uh, of the squadron you do christmas for us and we'll do new year for you and, you know, you, you it's give and take. So that's station duty officers. What else have you got? Oh, and then there was on the station, there was a plethora of other jobs. Officer IC, they were called. And they could arrange from things like Officer IC of Sport, which if you were into something, um, could be quite fun. You could go away with the team. Again, I learned this late in life. Um, I became Officer IC Shooting and Officer IC Golf. So when they went away for a match, I'd have to, I'd have to go with them. So I'm sorry. I'm the officer. <laughs> I'm responsible. I've got the money and all the rest of it. And the other officer I see will be there. So I've got to have the afternoon off to play golf. So it was a bit of a sky, but someone had to do it. And why shouldn't it be me? Uh, and if there was a command game, obviously the AOC would be there. So I'd have to go all day for that. So, um, yeah. So officer I see there was, I also got officer I see equitation. Now, I don't know the back end of a horse from a front end of a horse. So that was a steep learning curve. And they had me going over jumps in the indoor arena. And I thought, well, mm, this is a bit odd. I didn't really sign up to go horse riding. But yeah, it was part of life's rich tapestry. And I quite enjoyed that in the end. Um, and then you get things like, obviously, I see a bar, maybe the officer's mess bar. Uh, you might be responsible for, I don't know who ran the um, sergeant's mess bar. They were lawn from themselves, you know, like like um, like the dwarfs, you know, they, they would keep it all very secret. Um, I know a particular bad job I had, which was Officer IC Families Club. Now, if ever there's a recipe for getting yourself in the poo, that, that's it. Luckily, I had an admin officer who did the bar for me. The catering officer did the bar. So that saved an awful lot of work. So we did it between us. But again, you get involved with domestics and squabbles. Oh, no. And I said to the boss, boss, why give it to me? Why not give it to one of the junior officers and they'll learn a lot? He said, because I want it done properly. I don't want any cock-ups. I went, great. <laughs> you know, so again, all the youngsters were doing all the niff now. Um, what else was that? there? Oh, another one I had, which I hated with a vengeance, was Officer, I see a barrack block where the lads slept and you'd have to go around on station commander's inspection day and take the station commander around and the station warrant officer and all the minions and, and you had the keys to all the rooms and you'd go in and make sure that, well, you'd actually go in, the, you know, after two the night before to make sure that they were working, you know, to make sure they were cleaning it. And then the next morning, whatever the time was, 10 o'clock, You'd have to be there. So that's a day, almost a day offline. And you'd have to open the doors and make sure it was tidy. And I can remember one lad who was taken over from me. I said, look, come on, I'll show you around the block and um, I'll take you to the corporal's room, which was a, he had a nice room of his own. I said, he's a good lad and he keeps the place immaculate. 
every time I've been in there, was like, open the door. And I swear not. No, I, I can't exaggerate enough. There were Coke tins, empty Coke tins everywhere. I, wallpaper. <laughs> the whole place was like a mine that I discovered of unfound Coke tins in the world. There must be hundreds. I said to the bloke, yeah. don't ask. I don't know. I don't want to know. I'll lock his door. There you go. There's the key. It's all yours. You sort it out. So I don't know what happened after that. So that was barrack blocks. So there was all sorts of other things which went on. Um, and then you get squadron duties. Now, the list is as long as you're armed. And I've just about had every single job on the squadron. Uh, one of the busiest was adjutant. You would think you would have a professional full-time adjutant. I had a sergeant. And I had three typists, two typists. I can't remember. A number of typists. This is in the days before everybody had their own worktop or, or desktop and basically you just sort of try to keep the, the squadron admin running as smoothly as possible so you would allocate some of these duties to other people so i'd get a list in or I, I need 20 officers for the month you know for these duties you know um or, or the officer station duty officer or whatever and you'd have to put names in frames and then you'd have knock knock, knock on the door i can't do friday i it's my birthday. Oh, I can't go Saturday. I've got to go and visit the kids. Oh, no, Monday. No, I can't do Monday. Remember Tuesday. And you go, for goodness sake. <laughs> so you fight to get everybody to do their right jobs. And so that was fun in a good because it meant that I didn't have to give myself the bad jobs. So again, you got to. You, in the military, every, every military guy knows you got to got to go with the flow. And, and if there's a chance to, it's like when I was expedition and training officer and survival officer, not a job which I particularly um, particularly fancy, but um, they wanted uh, volunteers to go out to Germany on the um, survival escape and evasion course. Mm. So I just sent the name Keeble in, sent it off, and everybody went, why is he going? Because he's expedition officer, he can go. And they said, but we want to go because it's four days skiing. Four days running around the mountains with the Germans chasing you, and four days skiing if you survive. And um, so you had to have your perks. So well, that's what I forgot about. Then there was security officer. There were no perks in security officer. None at all. Hated it. You had to make sure every so often, usually every month, that all the books in the security safe were there and present wow. and signed for. And I lost 39 top secret books. Which was, Just you. <laughs> yeah. Didn't actually lose them. I had destroyed them on a certificate. And you used to have a destruction certificate. And you'd write down all the stuff you were either burning or sending away to, to a higher authority. And that was your proof. One copy. One copy on file. If it disappeared off the file, as mine did, well, I actually sold it to the Russians, but don't tell anybody. If it disappeared... You, how could you prove it? I had my own sergeant, my own sergeant accompanying, accompanying me for days, going around, checking everything, you know, looking into everything. Wow. And then one day he wasn't there. And I said, where's Sergeant Smith gone? He said, oh, they the, the other squadron, someone had shoved a whole load of secret documents under a cushion, under an armchair, because the safe was locked and they couldn't get in and they couldn't be bothered to find the key holder. And so someone found it later on, the cleaner found it. Wow. So he disappeared. That was a real, that was a real uh, case that was. So he disappeared. Then there was things like fund, squadron fund. I had to take over the squadron fund, which uh, was running at a huge loss because people were nicking stuff out of the fridge and uh, and for it so i came up with a cunning plan i said to my security staff because i had a flight sergeant who was my adjutant and a corporal i said would you be so kind to sign everything over the security it was totally legal could you put it in the security and then people will sign for it and pay for it and i'll, I'll charge them later mm -hmm. One day, the boss uh, at uh, what they call One Line, this was on a Friday afternoon, we all get together and, and chat about the boss. said, how much is in the fund, Phil? I said, pound, sir. He said, how much? I said, well, I hope to buy a bungalow in, Sp in Spain so to go on R&R. &R. He said, how much have you got? I said, well, it's four figures. He said, spend it. 
So it was just before Christmas. So we had the biggest, best mm. bash that we'd ever had. We invited everybody that could walk, not all of them could at the end of it, to our squadron. And we had everything. I spent probably about 700 quid. And this is going back a few years. It was a big, it was a big sum. And we then had a manageable amount. So that was the squadron fund. What else? Crypto. Crypto was probably the worst job of the lot. That's cryptology. That's all the codes. Hmm. So you go across to a secure container. You check every page, not not every document. Every page is checked, and it's got every single day for the coming period. And this is what the crews used to fly with in the air. So, for example, if you're flying along and your GCI controller, ground control, intercept controller, radar, and you said, uh, Bravo 22, are you there? And I'd go, yes. Authenticate Fox or Oscar or whatever. And then you'd go, well, what's the date? What's the time? Fox or Oscar. And you'd go, uh, Charlie Kilo. And I'd go, correct. And then we would talk. Because, mm-hmm. no, we were the only two people in the world that had that code. Yeah. So I knew that you were genuine. But you'd have to... And, Every, every time he got taken out by air crew, which was all the time, you'd have to check it out, check it in. Um, and then at the end of the month, it would go across for destruction to get a new lot. And you'd have to check every page. And, of course, someone had left a copy in their, in their flying suit. And you'd have to go and for oh, dear, hated crypto. And it'd get you into big trouble as well. Mm. So that's crypto. It was 540, which is a form... It's an REF diary, which you write every month, telling what's going on, number of hours you've flown, um, how many aircraft you've got, um, where you've been, you know, on detachment, or just a diary of the REF squadron's movements. Um, Another boring job, but I used to liven it up a bit and put funnies in, and and the boss said, you can't write funnies, it's an official document. (laughs) I said, I can, sir, because I had a phone call from the REF. Um, historical branch say so brilliant you're given a, a flavor of what the air force is really about not just sterile numbers and you know boring stuff so oh, that was good fun um and then you could have coffee bar and catering so they all had to be stocked up because the crews yeah. need their food and their biscuits and you know and then you had to get the catering people in at lunchtime to bring the sandwiches across and and the rolls and the and the lasagnas or whatever um and then you had squadron history, which was interesting, but that meant you got a lot of the visits. That was another thing as well, showing visitors around, because you were the authority on the history of the squadron. You'd have to wow. spout it off. Yeah. Um, but I quite enjoy it because I like history. Squadron magazine, again, another great one. I didn't want to do it, but it was a great way of getting back at people because that was a station magazine and each squad did their own bit and you could write what you liked. And <laughs> if you had a sense of humour, the boss would let you get away with it. Right. But the funny thing was, I used to get phone calls from the other squadrons and go, Phil, we can't write what we want to write because our boss won't let us. Because you, you slip the following in and all hell would break loose because that wing commander would phone my wing commander and go, where did your man get that information from? <laughs> of course bit like the um, uh, seal of uh, what's it the uh, silence what solicitors do you can't you know yeah, yeah. I can't you know what I mean I know what you mean I, yeah. I said I'm sorry boss I can't tell you who told me you know you'll have to court martial him and me so I used to write all sorts of stuff and God. that it, 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 it was great because people would say hey do you want a cartoon and they'd do cartoons for me and I'd slip those in as well so you know actually that was one of the first ways I got into writing because I used to write the the, the Squadron uh, magazine, and I used to do other bits as well. On another nom de plume, I would do Rodney Divot, the golf officer, and I would do other things. I'd sometimes put an anonymous one in under, you know, Fred Farnsbunts or something, and the um, my mate on who was running the magazine would, would, would print them sometimes because they were just funny. Um, entertainments, obviously, especially when you're away overseas, you, you need, a, you know, films organized and day trips out and coach trips and, you know, just sort of the boys going mad and drinking all the time. Then you'd have the worst job. The one job I didn't have on a squadron was sports officer. I wonder why, you know, because you had to organize the football matches and, you know, all the other, you know, keep fit and all that. And yeah. for me, 
<laughs> and then you had actually uh, professional duties on the squadron, things like duty pilot, or occasionally you might find a navigator that would be duty air crew, but they'd be too busy hiding to, to get hold of them very often. Um, and you'd have to go up the control tower and sit there all afternoon or all morning or all evening mm -hmm. for a ship uh, with the air traffickers and just make sure that everything was running smoothly with the flying. Um, that's not operations. That's just making sure that nobody was cocking up. Um, you'd have to look at the weather and uh, make sure that, you know, speak to the Met man every hour on the hour. Um, look at the runway state, you know, all sorts of things that can happen in an airfield. And I can remember one day I was up in, I was in Lincolnshire and the Met man said, yeah, there's a bit like this weather. He said, there's a storm to the south, but it won't be here until two o'clock. So I, I phoned the squad and the phone ops. I said, it looks like we've got room for a, a, a slot, a wave. And so everybody went off flying and I'm sat there and I was listening to the, 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 the general radio and I could hear RAF Crammel about oh. 12, 14 miles down the road go, recall all aircraft, we're going out in snow. <clears throat> and I went, what? I phoned the mapman and I said, what's this snow? He said, no, 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 it's just Crammel, it's just a shower. And I could see this storm coming, snowstorm. Right. And of course, it's not like getting jet propers back from Barkston Heath or, yeah. or Anthem. These guys were flying off in the North Sea and it's oh, shit. Excuse my friend. <laughs> so I had to, I then got on to Ops and said, phone the GCIs, phone air traffic, general recall, all aircraft back to Collins, we all divert. And I got the last one down, landed just as this storm raced across the airfield and blacked the aircraft, and that was the airfield out. Wow. Anybody else that was airborne would have to go away to Germany or, or wherever, right. or wherever they were flying, Scotland probably. So, yeah, there was a big, big responsible job. You deal with emergencies, which is one of the biggest jobs. So if someone had an emergency, and I've dealt with all sorts, like um, I dealt with a pilot that couldn't get his nose wheel down on a Phantom one night, and he was running short of fuel, and it was quite scary. And the drills were very difficult. You had to take into consideration what wing stores you had on and your fuel mm. weight. In other words, you know, did you have pylons? Did you have missiles? Did you have dummy missiles, fuel tanks and so on? And he said, whatever you do, don't land before the cable with the nose wheel up. He couldn't get it down. We tried everything. Mm -hmm. Tried absolutely everything. Gee, oh, uh, yeah. And I thought, well, this is a, a horror. So obviously we didn't have time to de-rig the cable. There wasn't time because he was on fuel minimum. So um, I said, well, okay, the only thing we can do is try and land, put your hook down and try and land as far as you can in the middle of the runway and then take the far end cable to mm -hmm. stop you off into the bunder. So he came round on finals. Everybody was very tense. And as it happened, as he overflew the approach end cable, he caught it with his hook. If I remember right, the phantom hook was somewhere like about 45 feet below the eye line of the cockpit. Right. So it was a long way down. So he caught it with his hook, and it brought him up. Bit of a smack on the ground, but it brought him up very quickly with very little damage considering what could have happened. Because the problem with submarine and the cable, going the nose underneath it, because it was rigged, was that the cable could come over the top of the canopy mm -hmm. and take the back seat his head. Not nice. It was a horrible emergency. Um, I've had um, tornadoes with flat failures, wing sweep failures, and I was landing exceptionally fast on the runway. Um, so you had to be on the ball. Um, so that was um, that was duty pilot navigators, duty pilot, duty air crew, you like to call it. But um, I don't remember seeing many navigators take take over. <laughs> and then you had other professional abilities. You had lectures to do. So if you were QFI, an instrument rating examiner, or a QY, you'd have to give lectures uh, to new crews, or um, uh, on a Friday afternoon we would have lectures because Friday afternoon there was not much flying, if any, uh, because it gave a chance for the engineers to hackle the aircraft before they tucked them up for the weekend and so on. So uh, that was filled full of all sorts of So, so far, probably half your week could easily be taken up with NIFNAF and trivia. Wow. 
quite scary. And then I've saved the worst to last. <laughs> no, here we go. A couple of jobs. Um, I'll, I'll take them because they sort of go together. What, a programmer. The OCU, the, the, the Phantom and the Tornado OCU, um, were probably, uh, in their own respective timescales, were probably the um, busiest units in Strike Command. We used to have, hopefully, if we had the aircraft, 12 into 12 into 8. So that's three waves. And if you take think that a wave with turnaround times and preparation times can take four hours, yeah? So that's a 12-hour day yeah. or more. We would start at 8 in the morning. I'll often go through to 2 o'clock in the morning, the following yeah. morning. So it's a long day, depending on serviceability and how many aircraft you needed. So it's 12 aircraft into 12 aircraft into 8 aircraft. Doesn't sound a lot, <coughs> but you had two long courses and a short course. And that's a lot of students. I can't remember, probably 20, 30 students per course. Mm. And they all had to be programmed into slots. It was like an enormous jigsaw puzzle. Mm -hmm. um, and there were no computers. You did it all on a big chronograph board with a cloth. Uh, you'd get the inputs from the course officer. You say, I want these six slots, and I want these sorties in these six slots. And so you'd have to juggle it and say, well, I can't give you that because the QIs want the first four in the morning. Or, Can you do this? And it was all give and take. But I would spend, I would come off the flying program at lunchtime, and then I would start to get my skeleton working, ready for when the inputs came in, maybe at about 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And then the juggling would start. And then about seven o'clock, I would go home, have a bottle of sherry to get over it. <laughs> and at eight o'clock, you get a phone call. Hello, Phil. I can't make it to the slot tomorrow afternoon. I didn't tell you, but I think you might find it. I won't be there. <laughs> so I have to drop it all out. And just, you know, what, who can I put in there? Then you have to phone somebody else that will say, hey, listen, sorry, mate, but you're going to have to make the four o'clock tomorrow. Yeah. You know, and so on. I hated that job. It was very stressful as well. Sounds That's like the one job I stitched up. I gave to my navigator. When I'd done it for about six months, I said, he doesn't do bugger all. I won't tell you his name, Steve. But uh, <laughs> he got given it. Didn't you, Haslam? And, oh, there um, we go. <laughs> yeah, he's a good lad. Um, and then the other side of it was, in the morning, well, all during the day, You'd have a programmer with a duty corporal or duty sergeant and an engineer on three desks. And it was your job between the three of you to make sure that program went as close as you could to what the, right. the programmer intended. And that would start at oh crack dawn. You'd open the, the squadron up, yeah. get everything sorted out, put the kettle on. And then you'd be running that, um, you know, almost like a train set, making sure that that student was there for that slot and... Uh, and, but, of course, it only took the weather like today for the wind to pick up and the whole lot. And then you'd have to change all the crews. Yeah. You couldn't have baby pilots going. You'd have to find experienced pilots. And and um, I've even flown a sortie as a pilot in the back of a uh, tornado, I think it was, with no stick. We were so, we were so desperate for flying. They said, Phil... Will you go up as a navigator? Easy job. I said, yeah, I can do it. <laughs> but um, and that's how that's how time. And it it was a a, pack, a house of cards. The whole lot could collapse if one person took yeah. one card. The whole lot would come Very down. Delicate. A horrible, horrible job. But you get used to it. And guys, like everything, the longer you do it, the more you get familiar. You know the the pitfalls. You know where people hide. You know, you can find them and so on. So that's duty off. Then there were some really silly little jobs. So we need a silly little job doing. Let's find someone to. I'll give you two. One was when I was on 43 squad, and the squadron mascot was a chickens. Mm -hmm. We had three, four chickens, something like that. Someone had to look after them. They don't look after themselves. So that was the junior nav's job, thank goodness. They used to stitch in with that. And so the junior nav, we have to make sure the chickens were fed and watered and the foxes didn't get them and all the rest of it. And um, you'd have to put them out uh, if there was a visitor. And he'd had a leather thong, which we tied to the um, this, uh, the flagpole, uh, and they'd be on parade. And um, I remember one night he was trying to get the chickens out. Oh, we had a cage. 
for a squadron guest night and the chicken, one of the chickens, the black and white chicken, was sitting there during the guest night. Uh, and he was trying to get this chicken out of this wire netting enclosure. And I remember I had my motorbike and I was following him around with my headlight so he could try and catch his bloody... I nearly fell off my motorbike. It was so funny. This poor lad trying to catch a chicken that doesn't yeah. want to be caught. And it's a fighting cock. Yeah. This, this is not your egg laying. This is your yeah. poor stuff, you know. Oh, I nearly wet myself. Anyway, one night, we were in a squadron guest night, and he left the chickens out tied oh. to the front. <laughs> so the RAF police had found them. So we, we got a message. I don't know who, who brought The mess manager brought the message in to the boss. And, um, and, and the boss went to the junior now, Paul, get down the squadron now immediately. The fox has eaten the chickens, you left him out. And the poor bloke went white with fear. Oh. The precious, but they hadn't. The yeah. RAF police had, had made sure they hadn't. So he had a rush off from the guest night, middle of his dinner, and then going, and of course the chickens were all right. <laughs> so... And talking of, of foxes getting them, I remember one. There, there, there is an apocryphal story, and I know it's true, because I've spoken to somebody that was there at the time, although it may have changed over the years. There is a famous person in the evidence called Dead Dog. He's also a famous person in the real world, but I'm not going to mention his name. It would be cruel. Okay. Because when he arrived out in RAF Germany, the squad did two tricks on him. Trick number one was they put him in a mess annex a long way from the mess. So whenever he went for breakfast, he had to get up, walk to the mess in all weathers, and then so on. If he wanted yeah. dinner at night, he'd have to walk to the mess for dinner and then walk back. If he wanted a beer, the same. If he wanted to go and read the papers, he'd... And, and they, they said there were no rooms in the mess. The whole mess was full. He was in this annex on his own, and he'd have to wait until there was a room spare, which he did, bless him. He's a nice lad. The other thing that they said was the stage commander's wife had donated an Alsatian to the RAF police for the RAF mm. police to train to become a, an RAF police dog. Mm -hmm. It didn't happen. It happened to RAF Debden at the time, all official, but he didn't realise that. But his job was to look after this, this Alsatian. He had to check on it every day. He had to make sure it was fed, make sure it was taken, taken for walks. He was totally responsible for the South Section, and he did for a while. Anyway, he went in one day, and the kennel was empty. The bowl was empty. Everything was tidied up. And he went to see the uh, the police flight thing. And I'm sorry, sir. Uh, my dog's dead. Uh, it looks like it got rat poison in its food. It died a horrible death. Oh, that's right. The other thing he had to do was report to the station commander's wife once a week oh. with all the paperwork. You have to wow. fill in the paperwork. And so... They said, I'm sorry, we, we've, we've called the local vet in. They didn't. It was somebody pretending. We called the local vet in, and you have to fill in the forms and all the rest of it. It's an RAF. You know, he's got an RAF number. He's, yeah. he's a proper member That's of the brilliant. RAF. You know, he's died on duty. There's all sorts of paperwork on this. And this poor bloke, he seriously thought about running away. No oh, way. Oh, seriously. He thought he was up to there in it. Oh, and yeah. uh, he was scared shitless, scared shitless. <laughs> and um, he thought he'd killed this dog by not looking after its uh, dog food properly. Oh. Anyway, he went in the next morning and he said, oh, the station commander wants to see you. I said, oh. So he went up and there was his wife sat there with the dog, perfectly happy. <laughs> <laughs> so from there on, he was called Dead Dog. And that was the name forever. And he is known. If, you know, in the air defence world, are probably wider, much wider. If you said, who's dead dog, they'll go, it's so-and-so. And, -so. and he, he's been on television. He's quite well known. Anyway, when he got back to the mess, they'd moved all his stuff out of the annex and into a nice room in the mess. And then when he went into the bar, there was a big cheer and as much beer as he could drink and all the rest of it. So the Air Force can be very cruel. But yeah, you wind up merchants, totally, aren't you? You what? <laughs> you wind up merchants. Oh, but they could be very kind with it as well. Yes. He, he had cred after that. I mean, he took it well. So uh, we're getting off the subject. Um, oh, well, there was all sorts of other things. There was court martials. You get called for a, uh, an RAF court martial, uh, either as an officer under instruction to begin with or as uh, a junior member. And they could be interesting. 
Um, you might even have a charge on a, a squadron, which you may have to uh, take part with, you know. Um, boards of inquiries, you know, crashes, things yeah. like that you may get involved with. You might get involved with actually going to the site or you might involve as an expert witness, which I have on one occasion uh, when a bulldog went in um, and give evidence. Um, uh, all sorts of things like that. What else have you got? Well, that's about all what I would call secondary duties. There were other duties. You're thinking, how long? How much time did you have to go flying? And the answer, yeah. <laughs> the answer was well, not very that. much, to be honest. Right. Then within your own professional sphere, air defence ground attack, mud moving, and recce, and whatever you had, uh, maritime, you had professional target study. So you would go into a, a locked vault and you would study what you had to study. So in there was all those secret books I was telling you about. Mm -hmm. I defense, there was all, every single Russian piece of equipment, fighter, bomber, um, everything, everything that flew, wow. helicopters, transport, they were all in there and you had to study them and know where you were superior, where they were superior, you know, the best way of fighting them, the tactics, all the rest of it. And you'd have to do that. And recce tests, you'd have to, uh, you know, learn just a flash on a screen of an aircraft two or three miles away. What is it? Is it an F-16? Is it a, um, a Jaguar? Uh, and or... just to interrupt you there, Keith, could you take out these files at any time, like any point in time, or was it like given to you at a certain slot? Could, or could you be like, I want to research the MiG-23 or something like that? Incredible. Generally speaking, you'd have to do that in your own time. Right. So if the vault was bad and you couldn't fly, that's when you would go off to the, the vault. Right. Um, when I was on recce, we'd have to go and study certain routes to certain places, um, in and out. I don't suppose there's much chance of coming out, but certainly in. Um, places of interest. Mud movers, the same. They all had targets over the border. Um, and, you know, and so that spent a lot of their time. QRA was... If you were lucky enough to have a vault in QRA, you could spend a lot of time because the muds never launched. Very, mm. they never launched, in my opinion, uh, my uh, experience. So you could spend a lot of time studying the opposition, and um, and then on on the gain on the wreck, you'd have to learn every single piece of Russian ground equipment and wow. flying equipment and boat. We learned every single boat to recognise it, Christ. every single gun, tank, um, APR. Uh, self-propelled gun, um, you name it. My no wonder my brain got shot. You know, this is what's left of <laughs> a workable brain, uh, and that was a lot of work. Then on top of all that, there were regulations. You had to once every so often, and it was some were yearly, some were quarterly. You had to learn um, uh, group S off orders, which controlled what you did, what you couldn't do. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, the rules and regulations, basically the law. So you had to read those Queen's regulations, um, AP1234, which was the principles of flight. You had to read that ever so often. After a while, you probably didn't read it as often as you should, because yeah. you knew, well, you didn't know it, but you had a, a very strong gist of what it was all about. Um, and that was all done in your own time. And then finally, you had to upgrade your qualifications which was my bet noir, uh, and that's professional, you know, like how do things work? How yeah. does the weather work? How does flying work? How do engines work? How do how does radar work? And my brain had given up at that stage, and I was quite happy with just being Joe Bloggs. Um, and all that had to be squeezed in, and often you'd, you'd have your own books for that, and you'd take them home at night and sit and read them. You know, if you were coming up to a renewal or requal, I've spent as much as long as six months, almost every night, reading the books and making sure that, you know, and you might even go away for a couple of weeks yeah. to a, 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 a training camp, if you like, uh, where you sit and give lectures and listen to lectures and lectures from one another um, and so on. So that gives you, in a nutshell, a very, very tiny, minute idea or what it's like to be a general duties person. Now, obviously, air traffickers probably have the same, not quite to the same degree, obviously. Uh, fighter controllers would have been the same, engineers, administrators, 
They didn't have all that plethora of, of um, crap, but they would have had a fair bit. And they did their share. The one people that didn't were the people that had lived in the cave, which was a little black hole where the navigators hid. And access was controlled and restricted, <laughs> and you couldn't get in there if you weren't invited, and you weren't invited. And they would hide there, eating their, their, their dolly mixtures one by one, <laughs> counting them out. Oh, I've got a pink and white one. And they would all bugger off home at four o'clock in the afternoon and watch Bargain Hunt or whatever, you know, the clothes show or whatever they were. Whatever they were watching at the time. No offence to Nabs on this, by the way. I don't want to get in trouble here. <laughs> worst job, seriously. The worst place to be was a, a, a weapons, a, a QFI, or say a weapons instructor. No, they were just nasty pieces of work. But flying instructors, because you'd have to start off with the conversions in the morning, yeah, get them done, so that they could probably do something and qualify them. Maybe they were out of date with their flying qualifications, so you'd have to re-evaluate them or re-qualify them so they could go flying on their own. So you start off early, get them done, and then you do the same probably for night flying. And in fact, the navigators very, very rarely flew at night, apart from weapon sorties where, you know, you'd have yeah. 1v1 or 2v2 um, uh, air defense. Um, and so I've often been in at 8 in the morning and still been there flying at 8 at night, wow. which is, you know, but you take it. It was uh, good fun, good fun. I hated some of those jobs, which I've just read out. Hated them with us, especially the ones that could get you into trouble. Court martialed, you know. Um, no, not nice, but you did them. It was all part of the job. The one thing was, uh, the saving grace was, you were there to do uh, a job. You were there to fly, in my case. And other people may not actually have, got the benefit of that and i know obviously engineers and uh, and administrators probably um we came a couple of trips not very often sadly but you got to fly and that's what i joined for and that's what young people if they're going to join the air force i don't know what the air force is like today i with fewer people there's probably more jobs around there is a, i've just remembered one trick you should always carry around a, a secret file with you an empty one Nothing in it, but if people see you with a secret file, they won't bother you with giving you anything else because they go, oh, all secret files, oh, don't touch him. There's something going on. <laughs> so, there you go. So, so there you go. There's my top tip for the future, you know. But if, but as I say, if you uh, say the old adage is true, if you want to give, if you want to, my brain's gone there, if you want a good job doing and giving it to a busy man, and it's true, you do. You just make time for it. Otherwise, you just sit around and slob out and drink tea and eat biscuits. No, my goodness. Anyway. Yeah, absolutely. You kind of touched on that, Gabe. But I want to wrap up, like, this uh, chat. Um, yeah, so, like, obviously we have, like, people on the channel, young people who want to be, you know, fighter pilots or air crew or even in the military. And obviously they see Top Gun and they just think, you know, Army. women flying. Is it? It's not as clear as that, is it? Like, what would you? What would your advice to be that for these young guys coming in, young guys and girls? If, I mean, if you worked in business, you might have one job to do, and you might volunteer for that. In the military, you would need twice as many people to do everything, and there are there aren't twice as many, and you've got to do it. It's got to be done, and it's just part of the ethos, isn't it? It's part of the the ambiance of being, and it's part of the honour. And some of those jobs, you know, gave a lot of, um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, 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 pleasure. Well, not pleasure, honour, you oh, know. Yeah. Um, you know, when you've been involved with something quite tricky, you think, yeah, we did a good job there. As a, Sometimes as an individual, sometimes as a team, um, and so on. Yeah, I loved it. I mean, I wouldn't, honestly, I mean, I've done uh, many other jobs. Um, I was in the police force, which I loved as well. Uh, but you didn't get stupid jobs in the police force. <laughs> um, uh, I worked in industry. I worked for British Aerospace. I worked for the gas board. Um, and I worked for the lifeboats um, as a manager and all sorts. And there's nothing. The lifeboats were good, but there's nothing like it. There's nothing like the, yeah. the uh, fraternal friendship, the spirit of camaraderie, which you can't reproduce very easily anywhere else. Um, no, 10 out of 10. If you gave me my time again and said, would you do it all again? 
good and bad, and because there's both, I'd say, yeah, in a shop, in a heartbeat. Loved it. So, so I'm guessing your advice is go for it for these young guys and gals. Go for it. You won't regret it. You might sit around one afternoon with a pile of paperwork going, <laughs> I'm kill the bugger that gave me this, you know. But at the end of the, the month, you know, when you've had a couple of really good sorties, um, or if you're an engineer, you've produced the aircraft that the boss wanted, and you know, you feel good. You think, yeah, I've contributed. And it's important to contribute yes. to society, to the military, whatever, you know. There's not many jobs give you the same. Uh, there's a word which I can't find, the uh, job satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And that's, that, the, the pay up until probably the couple of pay reviews in the late 70s and 80s was awful. Very bad. And you did it for the love. Good job you did, because you wouldn't have done it for the money. Yes. The pay is now respectable. Mm -hmm. And so you get paid what you're worth. Mm -hmm. But So you're not doing it for the money. Um, even though it helps, you're doing it for the pride, pride in the middle, pride in the uniform, pride in the queen, pride in the kingdom, you know, and so on. Absolutely. Yeah, good. So we're going to wrap up by, uh, I'm just going to show you a few, uh, well, Keynes uh, wrote my, yeah. one of my favourite books here, Patrolling the Cold War oh. Skies, and he did a collaboration oh, my, with... My favourite book. It oh. is brilliant. So, is brilliant. So, Keeves, are they still available online? And is there a possibility to get any signed? I've got about three of each because uh, I bought an, an enormous number. And for the tax man, I've not made very much at all, I'm afraid. Um, the one with Dave Gledhill, which we wrote together, was is excellent. It's the first time I've actually had pleasure in saying to a navigator, well done, mate. But it is, <laughs> it is a very good book. If you want to learn a bit more about the nuts and bolts of flying um, a, a fast jet fighter. That's what that's about, how air defense works, how the Phantom flew. Um, and the other one, uh, what's it called? Just show Patrol, it again. Patrolling no, show it again. the Cold War Skies. Oh, yeah. That bloke is brilliant. Yeah, he's brilliant, that, isn't he? Well, that's, that's more of a, I wrote that as a funny. That's I started great. making notes all oh, 30 years ago thinking one day I'll put them in a book, and eventually I did. And that's things which I haven't mentioned today, things that went wrong that shouldn't have gone wrong. I should, called, I should have learned about flying from that, but I didn't. Brilliant. Well, Kahib's, uh, um thank you very much, and I'll link uh, the books in the description below, but thank you very much for coming on. It's been a pleasure. If anybody wants me a copy, PM me. And yes. I've I left, I'll sort them out at a good rate. Yeah, or you can uh, contact me and I'll put you in uh, contact with Keeves. But again, Keeves, cheers. It's been a pleasure. It's a deal, mate. Cheers. Cheers, mate. You're a pleasure. Talk.